Well, good morning, colleagues. Um, I, I have a feeling that some of you may have heard about the Gatsby benchmarks, uh, and I, so I, I kind of trying to judge this about how much I need to give on the, on the background to it. So I've kind of divided this 50-50 between saying a bit about the benchmarks project and how we came to the conclusion we came to, with a particular focus on employer engagement, and then the other half is about things we're doing now, new developments. Um, so the report, uh, you can find it on the web. Um, it, what you might find interesting is that there are a lot of appendices uh, to it, which include the country reports of the six countries that we visited. It's got some quite interesting detail. And um, also detail about the school survey that we did in, in England with, with a lot of quite rich data. And the PwC report when they costed what all this, and all the details are in there. So if, if you're interested and you want to have a further look, do go there. So. My uh, talk is going to be first a bit about the uh, project itself and secondly about the current developments. So back in 2013, um, I personally, I've always been very interested in uh, career guidance, particularly from the time when I was a head teacher and I realised what, what, a, what a critical part of social mobility career guidance is. If, if kids have got uh, a lot of um, a, a rich home background which with a lot of employment, a lot of people in employment, in skilled employment and, and a, a circle of family friends, they will quite likely provide the career guidance that they need. But if you don't have that in your home environment, the only place you will get it is school. And you're completely dependent on your school or college for it. And, and that's, that's where I began to feel that this is so much more important than currently, or, or certainly in 2013, it was rated to be by both both nationally and indeed often at school level. So if you want to know, um, so, so, so people were saying um, it's not very good in this country, uh, but I was asking myself, well, how would we know if it was good? And that was the idea of an international study that the Gatsby Foundation uh, asked me to do. And we uh, visited six countries, visited schools and colleges in six countries, talked to ministry officials, advisors, career specialists, and try to get a, immerse ourselves in the world of career guidance and find out what kind of standards you could take at an international level to define good career guidance. We did this. Um, I, I am no expert in careers. I know a little bit about it now. I knew even less then, but uh, we did this in collaboration with the University of Derby, who are extremely expert, and one member of the team here is here, Tristram Hooley. Well, what we found out that there is no... Uh, magic bullet. So there isn't, there isn't a quick fix to this. Uh, it's about doing a number of things, doing them well, and keeping doing them, and, and telling everyone you're doing them and making sure that you don't keep changing tack, which is in some ways um, uh, not the answer that policymakers necessarily want because they can't just focus on one thing and fix it. You need to do eight things, and there they are. They're defined by the eight benchmarks for career guidance, and uh, they Fold, it, fold down broadly into two parts, things you do in school and things you do with employers. And then the third part is a kind of stable system surrounding it all. And uh, in this talk, I'm going to just to say a little bit more about three of those benchmarks. And the first one is the idea of a stable careers program. So when I went to the then schools minister to give him a preview uh, of what we'd be doing, because he was interested... He said, yeah, OK, eight benchmarks, which is the most important one? You know, he, wanted, he wanted a quick fix. And I said, that there isn't. You've got to do all, all eight of them, I'm afraid. And he, he pressed me, no, yeah, yeah, but come on, there must be one more important than the others. And I said, well, actually, if there is one that's more important, it's stability. Because the thing that you find in countries like Finland, Netherlands, Germany, indeed, practically everywhere we went, is that there is a stable programme, not just at the school level, but at the national level too so that employers know what's happening and when, and teachers know what's happening when, and parents do and pupils do, and it kind of has a remorseless feel to it. And that might sound boring and it might sound ossified, but it's not, because that stability is very important, because employers are often years behind the curve in terms of what's happening in schools. And if it keeps changing, they won't be able to keep up and they won't be able to play the rich part that we know employers must play in career guidance. So every school or college should have an embedded a programme of career education, led from the top and understood by all. Um, and leadership is really important in this. Uh, the leadership, obviously, it needs backing by the school leaders, but leadership 
in the, in, in the sense of someone who conducts the orchestra, because this is a, an essentially multifaceted operation that spreads across the whole of the school and indeed local employers. And you need someone conducting the orchestra. And I'm going to say a bit more about the importance of, of career leaders later on. In the Netherlands, they've got a, a good name for it, school decan. So this is the person who, is, who lies at the heart of the whole enterprise of showing young people about the world of work. Um, they often have an office very close to the school principal's office. They're always involved in decision-making about things like the curriculum, subject choices, and so on. And, and that draws them into hard school. It gives them high status, and it means that career, is, career guidance is at the heart of what goes on in the school. It's very important, that. And also very important that they are valued by the, the school leaders. Now, I'm not going to do this, uh, you'll be glad to hear, from, for every one of these benchmarks. I, I wanted to show how each benchmark breaks down into a number, number of elements. And the reason for doing this is, what, first of all, obviously, to, to sort of give, give the granularity of it. But secondly, we wanted to make these as far as possible measurable so that schools could look at them and say, are we doing that? And that was important when we came to survey schools so that we could kind of measure up how the, how the country was doing against these benchmarks. So here we, we bro we've broken it down, I hope, into things that schools could say, yes, we're doing that or no, we're not. So has it got a structured careers programme? Is it published? And is it regularly evaluated? So that's, that's first benchmark stability. I've now picked out two others uh, which are about employer engagement, which is clearly of interest uh, to you today. And, the, and um, when, I, when I started this work, I, well, I was kind of thinking um, from my own school experience that it was, it, it's got to boil down to work experience because, you know, this sort of rich immersion in the workplace is really very important. It can be transformative to young people. But then I realised when, when we went around seeing what happens in other countries, there's actually two elements to it. There is the sort of multiple encounters with employers where you're constantly meeting different employers different sectors, different levels of organisations. And you're, you're giving youngsters a kind of 360-degree view of what the world of work looks like. And then added to that, of course, is what we would call work experience. So we've got these two benchmarks, and uh, benchmark number five, encounters with employers and employees. And we say that every, at least every year from the age of 11, you should have at least one and actually, in the best schools that I've seen, there's far more than that. It's, it's happening almost all the time. It's done very well in a lot of independent schools in this country, I have to say. And it's done very well in many maintained schools, but not all. And I mean, Claude has referred to Germany. It, it really is hugely impressive in Germany, the, the way they do this. And it's, it's like a kind of unspoken contract between employers and schools. It's, it's what you do. If you're an employer, this is what you do. You engage with the school and you're part of that education system. The apprenticeship runs without the government putting money into it. These engagements happen without the government putting money into it because employers get, and this, is, this goes back 100 years, it survived two world wars, it goes back a long, long way in Germany, this principle of um, collaboration between schools and employers. And of course, one of the results is that youth unemployment in Germany is lower than general unemployment, lower. Now, at this point, I'd just like to say a, a little bit about something that's happened very recently. I'm sure you'll uh, be, have, have it on, you, on your radar, and that is that um, Biz uh, asked Lord Sainsbury to do a review of technical education and training. I, I, I mentioned it at this point because it, it, Germany is so good at doing this kind of thing, and we need to get clearer to it. And as, as we all recognise, it is a very complex landscape, and it's one that's actually very difficult for school teachers to get to grips with, because often they haven't come through that route at all. Usually they haven't, in fact. So what the Sainsbury panel is recommending is a simplification of technical education and training, essentially a combination of the apprenticeship route with the taught route, 15, boiling it down to 15 clear routes and very strongly driven by employers who, who set the standards. So it's, it's very interesting and I hope it's going to have a strong influence on this landscape, making it much clearer for school to advise, schools to advise young people in it. So the second um, area, uh, the second benchmark that is closely related to employer engagement is experiences of workplace, 
work experience, if you, if you like, and this is the sort of m more immersive, intensive experience of the workplace. And we're saying that every pupil should have had at least one uh, work experience by the age of 16, and then another one after the age of 18. And as we all know, uh, work experience has become much more sort of fragmented in, in recent years. If we could be like Finland, I'm sorry to keep saying the F word, but Finland is really impressive uh, in, in, in this area and as in others. Um, and I saw what I've, which was the best, best work experience I've ever seen at a comprehensive school in Vyelska, which in which they start in year seven and it's essentially a work shadowing thing, but they do it in the school. They, 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 they spend a day with the people who do things in the school other than teaching. And I, I thought that was fantastic because, and I wish I'd thought of it when I was a head teacher actually, because it, kind of, it not only shows young people and very young people what the world of work is like, it also gives them a bit of respect for the people who often they take for granted. And then in, year, in grade eight, um, five days of work experience, and then in grade nine, nine days of work experience. And they do it. You know, they don't just say they do it, they do it, and it's high quality. So that's something to, something to aim for. Okay, uh, so now that's, that's, where we've, that's what we did, and I'd now just like to share with you uh, some of the things that we're currently doing, because we've been pleased um, how these benchmarks have had an impact uh, with uh, other organisations, and I'm particularly pleased that the Korean Enterprise Company, as Claudia has said, has made them at the heart of the work that they're doing. And I'm also pleased that the Department for Education has shown a great deal of interest uh, in, in, in the benchmarks as a possible structure for career strategy. But there are other organisations, and some of them are listed there. But perhaps the thing that pleased me most was when individual schools started picking up these benchmarks unbidden. So we, we published the report, and before very long, we found that schools were taking them, taking the report, looking at the appendix, which gives the data for the school survey that we carried out, and were checking themselves against the same questions that we asked the schools in our own survey. And they were seeing how they measured up. And I thought that was great, and it kind of made me feel, well, maybe these things will be useful for schools, and they're not just a systemic thing, that they're useful for schools, because that's where you make a difference. You make a difference in the schools. Um, so what are we doing? The, well, the, the, the first thing uh, is that we are, um, we've got a pilot running now in the northeast of the country in 13 schools and three colleges in which we've we, we, given them a little bit of money, not very much actually, and we've challenged them, um, okay, meet these benchmarks. The most valuable part of it uh, has been that we have a person working there, Ryan Gibson, who works very, very closely with the schools to help them to meet the benchmarks. And frankly, you don't actually need to put the money in. You just need, give, need to give the people the help. We put a little bit of incentive money in, but the thing that's really made a difference is the kind of guidance and the networking that happens between them. And their starting point was an audit, just, just like um, we did an audit uh, with our school survey in, in, the, in the work. And um, this, this is what came out. And on the face of it, it looks terribly discouraging. So um, eight schools or colleges achieved no benchmarks at all, and none achieved more than three. But actually, when you drill into it, you remember how the, uh, the first one I showed you had several aspects that you need to meet. When you drill into it, you actually find that schools are well on the way in most of these. And in fact, um, in, in the Northeast, every, every college, there were three colleges, achieved benchmark six fully. Um, and uh, seven of the schools or colleges partially achieved all eight of them. So they're on the way. And, and we're not starting from zero on this, and it would be churlish to suggest that any school is starting from zero on this. They're on the way, but guidance and clarity about where they need to go is what they find helpful. Now, the, the second uh, thing that we're doing, and this is in collaboration with the career and enterprise company, is to take that school survey, the audit tool that we, did, that we used in the original work, and try and make it into something that can be used by, on, on the large scale by schools and colleges across the country. And uh, it is called uh, Compass, uh, and you can find it on the web at compass-careers. And it is 
basically an online survey that schools can carry out. It doesn't take very long to do, and it tells them how they're doing against each one of the benchmarks. Now, what, what, what our ambition is that schools will carry this out and they will they'll, we'll then be able to begin to aggregate the data that comes out of it so that schools not only see how they're doing but see how they measure up against other schools. And when we've got enough uh, other sets of data, we will be able to filter it and <coughs> enable schools to compare with schools like them and so on. And of course, this will be absolutely confidential to the school that completes the audit. So have a look at that. It's in its beta version at the moment, and we're very keen to have feedback um, from anyone on how we can make this more useful. The other thing that we're doing is um, we're going to produce an FE version for it because we've very clear, it's terribly easy for someone like me and actually a lot of people who work in this field to assume that everywhere is like schools. And of course, FE sector works very differently from schools. So we're going to produce a, a, a dedicated FE version. Destinations data. So in, in the report, um, we were trying to think about, okay, here, here are eight benchmarks which define good career guidance. Um, how would you, how would you incentivize schools to actually use them and do things this way? And one of the th thoughts that we had was, could you make the school accountability system encourage schools to do school career guidance better? And that was, that was where we came up with some recommendations about destinations data. Actually, what we recommended is that schools should collect, collect destination data themselves and do it for three and a half years after students have left. It's quite a burden. Um, but to do it, if you do it for three and a half years, you've actually got some stability coming into a young person's life and they've, they've gone through their first sort of post-school post, post uh, period. So that was the recommendation. Um, but the, the interesting thing, and this was again in the Northeast, it, we really had some great ideas coming out of this pilot. They, they started saying, well, yeah, I mean, destinations data is good, but not for the reasons you're saying, not for the DFE to use it as an accountability measure, but because we find it useful. We can use it to see how well we're doing in career guidance. We can, we can use it to see whether we are really challenging stereotypes. And we can use it to show students where people like them have gone to in the past. And so what they're doing up in the Northeast is they've got a working group which is trying to define what would destination data look like if it was, defined, if it was designed for us to do our job better, not designed as an accountability measure. And then the perfection would be bringing together what the DFE wants to do with it and what schools and colleges say is useful. So it's, it's really quite interesting work. And of course, you know, the whole big data, there's such richness of data around now that that makes this job both uh, easier and more potent. The, the, the possibilities are enormous. So that some, some work um, to, to, to look out for. Finally, um, we are very interested in the, in the training needs of what you might call school leaders, uh, sorry, career leaders, um, what they call in the Netherlands the school de Um the, the, the leadership of career guidance is so important. And, and in a sense, in the work that we've done, it is the missing pillar, as Claudia described it to me just now. Um, if, 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 if we don't have strong leadership uh, at, the, at the level of the person who conducts the orchestra, then it's not going to work. So we're, going to, we're looking at what kind of training needs there are. There's already some good training around. Teach First has got a, a, a really good training program, and there, there, are, there are other training programs around. But what we're interested in, not surprisingly, is what would the training look like if it was focused on the Gatsby benchmarks. So that's, that's work in progress. So I think that's everything from me, Nick. Um, leave you with a final message which we put in the report that in the end this will work best and actually it'll only work if schools want to do it if if head teachers governors school leaders actually say to themselves look this is such a high priority we're going to have to get ourselves organized get ourselves geared up to to do it as they are in the schools in the northeast and if they do that they will make a difference to young people for the rest of their lives Thank you.